Okay. Awesome. How's everybody doing today? I found my glasses. They were in the snow. What? Yeah. They were behind the, like, where we had the earth garden box. Buried in the snow. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Some will be, yeah. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> who knows? Only I don't really need them that much, but yes, yes. to read, I should have them. All right, so we're going to be in Acts chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 12 through 42. Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 42. When anyone likes to volunteer to read some of those verses, we get, okay. Someone read, so you read 12 through 24, and we're going to need someone to read... Uh, 25 through 42. It's Acts chapter 5. It's in the New Testament. It's uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Okay. Mark, Luke, John, Luke. Acts. Chapter 5. Verses 12 to, 20, 12 to 24 is going to be read by Jamie. He's going to read 25 through 42. Christian, all right. So just let me uh, let me uh, let me know when you're there. Twelve to forty-two. Yeah. Thank you, baby. Mm -hmm. All right. You can go ahead, Jamie. Regular rebound among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in the supported house. None mm -hmm. of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. More than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats. But as Peter came by, at least the shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the part of the and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people of all the world the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the men of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they ret returned and reported. We found the prisoners securely lodged and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. <coughs> now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed <coughs> about them, wondering what this would come to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin and to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with the teaching and with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed, had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnessing witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, mm, yeah, yeah. a teacher of the law who was honored by all of the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a, for a little while. Then he addressed them, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thudia, Thudis, 
mm -hmm. appeared claiming to be somebody and about 400 men rallied to him. Mm -hmm. He was killed, all his followers were dispersed and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men, and you will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering great disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Awesome. All right. So just to recap what's happened, um, from verses 12 to 17, you got to remember the apostles are doing these signs and wonders, but it's not... It's not the apostles doing it. It's the Holy Spirit working through the apostle, much like a musician is working with the instrument and making that beautiful music. So they're doing these wonderful signs and wonders because they're, they're people whose hearts are bent towards the Lord and they just really, 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 really want to know Jesus. So signs and wonders are happening. Great things are going on. People are getting saved. I mean, it's getting to the point that people are actually coming by and a shadow is being cast by Peter and they're being healed. So this is a, a great thing, right? Now, um, today we're actually going to talk about jealousy, because I see the kids had a topic. We're going to talk about jealousy and suffering at the same time. It's going to be really, really fun. I'm really excited. I, I think I preached this like 15 times last night to myself. But, um, so let's start off right again in verse 12 through 16, where it says, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together at Simon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that even carried out the sick into the streets, laid them on cots and mats, that Peter came by, and at least his shadow might follow some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So what we see right here thus far, this is what happens when a body of believers is bound together with the pursuit of knowing Jesus and following him. Wondrous things are done. People are being healed. Salvation is being brought to the nations. Right? And they're, they're doing these things not for self-glorification. They're not doing these things to be known or to be seen. They're doing these things to bring people into Jesus. Now, the surrounding towns where people are being brought to Jesus, you got to understand. So, everyone knows they can come to Jerusalem to hear the gospel truth. They hear that truth from the apostles and they go back to their towns and tell everybody else. Right? And so this is a big thing. This is a huge thing, as a matter of fact. John 14, 12, when Jesus told his disciples, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater. Greater works these will do than I, because I am going to the Father. So these are the works that Jesus was talking about. Jesus was basically like one man going out and sharing the gospel and bringing people to him. Now he's got 12 going out, sharing the gospel, and bringing even more people to him. This is what Jesus meant when he said greater things, right? Now, some speculate the towns were Hebron, Bethlehem, Emus, Jericho, Lydia, and Joppa. So just imagine Jesus is in Spencer, and he changed all of Spencer, right? He dies, he's resurrected, and there are 12 that come out of that. And not only are people being affected in Spencer, people are being affected in Esterville, in Waterloo, in Des Moines, in Spirit Lake, in Milford, in Okaboji, which I don't think is a town. But they're being affected all over those places, and they're coming back to Spencer to hear the gospel, right? So this, this whole thing, is, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's like a revolution, Right? Things are changing. People are being saved and salvation has come to these people. And they're just, they're just exalting this. Now here's the problem though. Right? The Sanhedrin, remember, they wanted to silence Jesus. Right? They wanted to cut, just, just kill him off. Now what happens when you got 12 guys doing the exact same thing? Right? Jesus took enough of their influence. He's supposed to be dead and gone. But now you got these 12 guys who are speaking up and things are starting to happen. So that brings us to verse 17. It said, But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. 
But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to all the people the words of this life. And then they heard this, they entered the temple and daybreak and began to teach. So he knows in verse 17, the Sanhedrin got jealous. Right? Listen, jealousy will get the best of us. And you got to understand this too, jealousy has to do more with us than the person we're jealous of. Jealousy shows, it shows our anxiety of how we really feel about ourselves. It shows our insecurities. It shows that we feel threatened by somebody else for whatever reason. It shows that we're upset, we're angry, we distrust people. But more importantly, it shows us that we're not content in Christ. Right? If I'm jealous of you for whatever reason, my contentment in that situation is not in Christ. If I come to your house and see your marriage and go, oh, I wish my marriage was like that, my contentment is not in Christ. Right? Because cause here's the thing. Well, we always think the grass is green on the other side. Because it, it looks that way, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Right? When you go to somebody's house who has a bigger house, has more stuff, you think things are better. Listen, the reason the grass appears greener on the other side is because they have more fertilizer. Mm, okay. Right? And, and we think we want the stuff that other people have, but they got more stuff going on. There's more issues that they have that we may not be able to see. And that's why our contentment has to be in Christ. You know, it, it, we, we think we want to, to be with somebody. I, I, I wish that was my girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I want to be with her. And then you're next to her and you realize, oh, this she was crazy the whole time. I didn't know that. <laughs> right? Our contentment is in Christ. You, you think you really want something until you have it. So our contentment should always be in Christ. And the Sadducees were so jealous of these apostles. It, it had nothing to do with what they were saying. It, it has to do with losing the authority. It, it, it had to do with not being in the same kind of position. And what did their jealousy lead to? Arresting them. Wanting them to disappear. Jealous. That, that's, not, that's not the way that we should make things. We shouldn't look at one another and, and want what the other person has. I should be excited that God is doing something in your life. I should be excited about your spouse and you and having a wonderful time. I, I, I shouldn't long for, oh, I wish she was my spouse. I shouldn't long for that. You shouldn't long, I wish she was my spouse. That shouldn't be something you long for. Your contentment's in Christ. You know, but we, we become self-deceived because our insecurities are showing. Somebody else got to sing. I didn't get to sing. I can sing better than that. You're insecure. Uh, you know what? I, I could probably I can, I can I can teach way better than that. You feel threatened. Why? Because I I, I no, no no your contentment is not in Christ in that situation. If, if Christ is King, if Christ is the Lord of all over you, then you should feel happy for people. You should feel excited. Somebody gets a new job, you shouldn't be like they shouldn't have got that job. Well, so you can do better. I know I can do better. Well, why didn't you get the job? Because they hating on me. As we used to say, we played a video game. They cheating. Who is they? They're not cheating. You're not, you, it's just, it's not your time. So listen, out of their anger, the Sadducees arrested the 12 apostles and had them placed next to offenders of the most horrendous crimes. You have to understand what the public prison meant. It, it, it wasn't like you're going to Milford Jail. It was like you went to the penitentiary. Right? They sent you to a place to be with, with, with murderers and, and all kind of vile acts. People who've done crazy things. That's where they're putting these people. You got to imagine being an apostle and all you did was share, share, the, share the love of Christ. And they, listen, it's, it's like you got a parking ticket and, and they give you uh, 35 to life. You don't even know how you got in federal prison. You just ran the stop sign one time. Right? And, and this, is what the, this is what the apostles were in. That kind of predicament. Now maybe they wanted to, to scare them. You know, kind of shake it up. Because this is what jealousy does. It, do you see how the sin of jealousy does not care about the outcome or the life of the other person? It only wants them to be disposed of to make look foolish in front of everybody else. That's all we want when we're jealous of somebody. Hope it, it, it falls flat on their face. And that everybody has come back to you to save the day. Listen, James 3.16 says this. For where jealousy and selfish ambition, ambition exists, there will be disorder in every vow practice. When we act jealous, even if you're jealous of your spouse, because sometimes that happens. Your wife makes more money than you. You get upset about that. Listen, if your wife makes more money than you, tell her to keep going to work. 
Don't, don't stop, baby. Girl, I love you. Uh, you want me to cook when you get home? Because I got you, boo. Listen, <laughs> let her go to work. If you're, if you're really united in Christ, your money is her money. It's not separate. Don't be jealous. You know, there, there was a time and day I remember Tamika got to speak everywhere. And when I, hey, I can speak. Yeah, 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 we know. Uh, Tamika, can you come back? She was speaking in all kinds of places, and I was just, hey, you know, I, I, I like to speak too. I, I can teach. I can. We know that guy. Come on, get out of the way. Tamika, please come here. And I remember the time that I felt that I felt threatened by her because I wanted to be where she was. But do, do you realize sometimes we're jealous because we're not ready? Oh, I can do it. No, you can't. That's why you're not doing it. That's why. I, listen, they didn't ask me. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't forget about me. Why I didn't speak? I just wasn't ready. It wasn't my time. And see, if, if we're chomping at the bit, as an old pastor told me one time, if you're sitting down listening to a sermon, you say, I can do better than that. He said, you're not ready. Because if you can't sit down and receive for somebody else, you're not ready. If, if you can't follow somebody, you're not ready to lead. Because jealousy will consume you. So listen, now in the midst of all this craziness though, an angel of the Lord freed them from the prison. Now, can you imagine that? You're locked up, and you don't know, you don't know when you're going to get out. And all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord just shows up. Hey, guys, how you doing? Yeah, you 12? Free to go? Price is paid, and you get out of here. Now, listen, here's the cool thing. For the people who arrested them, the Sadducees, it shows them that they're in open rebellion to God. It, it convicts them of their sin. For the apostles, it gave them an opportunity to go out and, and continue the mission. And it's an encouragement they're on the right track. For those who saw the angel of the Lord, for those who heard about it, it's another wondrous sign that God has done. And it's an answer to prayer. So all around, something was learned for everyone doing this great escape. And notice how he told the apostles, go out there and preach the words of life. Right Now, how many times does God deliver us and we get excited? God saves us, God, He blesses us, and we get excited, and then we just go about our way. Don't, don't even wonder why God did that. Now, notice the angel didn't say, okay, you guys are free. I want you to go to Bethlehem. I want you to go to Egypt and stay away because they're going to come after you. He told them to go back and continue the exact same thing. Because in the midst of persecution, we sometimes think we get a pause. We get to stop. They're threatening to fire me. So does that mean you stop sharing the gospel? Well, I might have to. No, that means you keep going. Well, I, I, you know, I, 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 might, I might lose something. They might not like me, but you keep going. Right? The, the message there was continue to share my word no matter what. This wasn't touched by an angel. It was an angel let him out and said, go and speak the words of life. Why? Because they needed to hear it. Now, I want you to notice, too, did he tell them to go back to the other Christians and talk with them about what happened? Where did he send them to? Back to the temple. Back to the exact spot they got arrested at. The scene of the crime. Right? This is, this is maybe not the safest thing, but he sent them right back to it. Now, here's the thing. When God does something great in your life, how often do you tell another Christian? And when God does something great in your life, how often do you tell somebody who doesn't believe? Do you ever, do, I mean, it made me think when I read that, how many times will I be willing to tell an atheist what God has done in my life? I'm quick to tell a Christian, hey man, listen, God just blessed me. You should have seen what God did for me. Now, with an unbeliever, hey man, did you see the game last night? Stephen Curry was on fire. He was an assassin. Right? We, we, we don't think about those things because our mindset is they won't receive it. They won't. Why would I tell them? Because they need to know it. Right? If, if I'm sick, I should go to the hospital. But if I can't get to the hospital, maybe the doctor should come to me. Listen, when God does something great and miraculous in your life, go and share it with someone who doesn't know him. Did you ever think that that might be the one thing that God is using to turn the tide in their heart? To make them think differently? If, if you have the words of life, why do you keep going to people who are alive? Why don't you go to people who are dying or dead spiritually? And share the truth with them. And watch what God does. I mean, I, it, it, it just it kept dawning on me how often we do that. We'll, we'll share a word of truth with those that we, we love, we know, those that we care about. 
But those who want nothing to do with Jesus will keep silent. Right? We, even if it's on my job, why can't I share my testimony of what God has done in my life today? God bless you with a job. How did you get this job? The Lord gave it to me. Man, you, 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 you look like you're happy today. God is good. Why can't we share it with them in the hopes that that might be the one thing? Because listen, somebody dared share the gospel with you. Now, I'm sure that was right grammar. But somebody dared to share the gospel with you. And look what it got you. We practice a two-minute test when we practice sharing what God has done in our lives so we can get used to saying it. So it becomes common nature. So yes, do I encourage you to talk to the atheists about what God has done in your life? Of course. They don't believe in God. Yet, you know what? That's smoke and mirror sometimes. Right? You, you remember when your mom used to tell you something to do something? You didn't agree with her? But secretly you did? But you want to put that front on your face like, you don't know what you're talking about. I don't need to eat no carrots because I'm pregnant. That back in your pocket, right? You, you don't realize it, but your parents, they told you some good wisdom. Yeah. Right? They put some, they lay some stuff down that, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Or when you go talk to somebody and you ask them a question, you still disagree with them. But in you're like, man, they right. For some of us who are married here, we get that a lot with our spouses. <laughs> Girl, you know what you're talking about. Let's go ahead and do that, though. You heard what your mom said. <laughs> right? Be- because we don't want to admit it, but secretly we agree. It's the same thing with people who say, I don't believe. Listen, there's some people who are struggling with belief. They just need somebody to share the truth with them. Don't let someone telling you, I, I don't think God is real, be a deterrent not to share the gospel. Because that could all be a front to see if you're going to actually press forward or move back. What I find, especially when I've done social work and, and, and shared the gospel with so many people, when you get close to a real subject, they get guarded and tell they don't want to know anymore. But secretly, they want you to keep pouring that stuff on. They want to hear some truth. Because they go back home with that stuff and it works. Now, going on. So, in verse 21 it says, Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council and all the sin of the people of Israel and sent to, prison, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, the men who you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. <laughs> and the captain and with the officers went and brought them back, not by force, for they are afraid of being stoned by the people. Now this part is funny to me. They woke up early the next morning and thinking, we did it. We got them. They're standing out. They said, bring them on out. The captain of the prison goes and he comes back. He's like, hey, hey, uh, the door's locked. You got some prisons in there. But those guys you sent, not in there. Now you got to understand this guy's panic. If you... Put someone in prison. If you're a guard in front of that door and the prisoner escapes, you know what happens in Jewish custom? Whatever their punishment was, that's what you get. So if their punishment was death, I mean, it was a rough job. If back then, I would not have been a prison guard. Right? If their punishment was torture, guess what happens to you? Right? It, it's supposed to be a deterrence not to let anybody escape. So they're panicking. And they said, listen, the door is locked. I don't know how these guys got out, but they're gone. Mm. Right? And they went through all this trouble. You got to remember, they went through everything to get this to happen. And now they're in a predicament where they don't know what's going to come next. Now listen, the going out explanation. Now this was probably reminding them exactly what happened to Jesus. They crucified Jesus and his body's gone and they can't explain it. Right? And, and you got to remember... What happened when Jesus was crucified? Twelve men started again and 8,000 people got saved. So now there's real fear. What's to come next? What will come of this? If these 12 men are out there again, are they going to lead more people to Christ? Are are things really going to change? So listen, they weren't worried about the apostles' safety, just their whereabouts. They didn't care if the apostles were alive or dead. They were just concerned how this would affect their power and control. This had nothing to do with the apostles themselves. It had all to do with the power that these people wanted. It's a sad day when we as Christians are more concerned about our selfish desires, having what we want, fear of loss of power, than we are about God moving in a miraculous way. 
When I'm more concerned about my power being lost. When I'm more concerned about myself losing control than God moving, I've lost it already. I've lost the focus. Listen, I've seen a grown man so consumed with his lust for power that he was willing to destroy believers right in his midst. Didn't care. I've seen that happen. But we should always be humble enough just to watch God do something, but willing to take a back seat if we need to. If, if, if taking a back seat means that Christ is going to glorify himself and I don't have to be jealous about you, then that's what we should be willing to do. We get so consumed with ourselves. We get, we get so just focused on us. I remember for our first, uh, I think, Valentine's Day, our first, Mika's, uh, I think, her birthday when we first got married, I got her a watch. You know why? Because I like watches. So if I like watches, she should like a watch. She hated that watch. <laughs> she couldn't stand that watch. Why? Because she doesn't like watches. I do. I think they're great. Tamika likes other things, but I was so consumed with myself that it didn't matter. You're going to like what I like. Why? Because I'm buying the gift. And I learned from that. I learned a very hard lesson that day, but I learned. Now I just, hey baby, here's a hundred bucks. What am I getting you this year? You show me. Oh girl, I'm good. I'm good at what I do. Right? But listen, when we are that consumed, when we are, are, are so jealous, we're going to miss God doing something great. That's a scary thing. That I miss God moving because I just want God to move through me and me alone. I miss God moving and God talking because I'm talking too much. I can't hear his voice because I'm, I'm yelling over it. I'm, I'm shouting over him and he's trying to say, I'm doing something great. Why are you opposing this? Why are you in the way? So news soon spread these men were arrested yesterday and were out in public speaking the word of life. And it's funny, instead of, instead of just arresting them by force like they did the day before, they came there to gently escort them away because they were afraid. Right? They were afraid if the people knew what was going on, what would happen. You see, you see what happens when we get jealous? We don't, we're not going to let everybody in the world know we're jealous because that's just that's too obvious. So we try to do a hush-hush thing. We, we, try to, we try to find ways to go behind people's back and, and, and stab them and bring them down, bring them to other ruin. Because if people knew what we were really doing, they would be appalled. They would. Could you imagine if people knew, if, if the people at your job knew how you really felt about them, could you imagine <laughs> how long you'd be employed? <laughs> if your boss knew you thought, boy, you don't know what you're doing, could you imagine how long you would work there? Your, 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 listen, your evaluation would be quick. You're fired. You can't work here. Why? Because our hearts. We're jealous. Right? It's, not, it's not always that our boss is doing a bad job. We just want to be our boss. It, it, it's not always that our, our, our fellow employees, our, our spouse is, is crazy. We just want to receive that glory ourselves. We like all the attention. Listen, one of the things I'm working on this year is listening how many times I talk about myself in a conversation. Because why am I talking about me? Right? If I'm in a conversation, unless you ask me, hey, can you tell me how you're doing or something, unless I'm giving an example to help you with something and I'm using myself, if I'm just talking about me, man, something's wrong with that. And now that I hear it more and more, I get so agitated with myself. Like, Joe, really? You know, anything else you got to say about yourself? Capricorn, what, I mean, what do you want to tell them? You know, because the thing is, it's not about us. Nor has it ever been about us. Because when we make it all about us, we will do anything, anything to take somebody else down. Listen, Pastor James from the book of James, they're just kids. Pastor James from the book of James, they're fine. Um, he still says the same thing. Every vile act sprouts its e evil, ugly head in the house of God when jealousy springs forth. When jealousy is right there, I paraphrase James 3.16, just in case. When evil and jealousy is around, listen, you're going to see some gross things happen. You're going to see people act in ways you never would have thought of. Right? It's easy when you see little kids get jealous of each other because you can pinpoint it, can't you? And you see how they treat each other. They'll snatch toys from each other. They'll laugh and mock at each other. But do you realize we as Christians do the exact same thing just in a Christian way? 
We'll throw a scripture at you. We'll tell you you're not mature enough yet. We'll tell you you don't know enough yet. We'll tell you, you know what, I'm way better than you. I'm, I'm seasoned. We'll tell you everything. We'll, we'll, we'll give you a CD just condemning you. We'll find the scriptures to hurt you. We'll do all those things intentionally. Why? Because we are only concerned about ourselves. Jealousy is an ugly thing. And God don't make you ugly. He made you fearfully and beautiful and you're wonderful. So stop acting ugly. Now, much like the apostles over here too, in the midst of our persecution, even if others are jealous of us, we still have an obligation to go and share the word of life. Just because you're being persecuted, just because people are jealous, just because people are hating on you, doesn't give you the opportunity to stop sharing the gospel. If anything, it should put you in a position to share it even more. If anything, that shouldn't even be your focus. Do you see the apostles saying, boy, those Sadducees, boy, they something else. (laughs) Do you see them getting in in a circle, praying together, saying, let's just pray God would just explode with that whole place up. No, they are back out there doing the will of God. Why? Because they're not allowing their emotions to get the best of them. There's still a job to do. Listen, I can tell you there are people who will be jealous of you. So what? Let them be jealous. It's got nothing to do with you. That's, That's their insecurity, not yours. If you focus all your attention on that, you're going to miss what God has called you to do. If you focus all your attention on, well, you know, I wish my kids would act like that. Your kids are so well behaved. But listen, they're not your kids, though. You, take care of your own kids. You're good. So what? Love your kids. Adore your kids. But don't get jealous because you see some other kids doing something totally different. Because honestly, when we, our kids act out, we don't look at our kids. You know who we look at? Other people. How's everybody looking at my kid? <laughs> are they, uh, hey, stop. Okay, they stop looking. Right? That, that's really what we do. Right? When, when, because we, we, it's our insecurity. If we go out on a date and your husband's not dressed well, you don't look at your husband. You look at, you going to dress like this for all these people? Right? It's not about him. It ain't got nothing to do with him. In the house, he's good. But when he come out in public, you disrespecting me. All these people, and it got nothing to do with them. Right? And, and that's the problem because we're really jealous. Because we see another guy walking by and he's nice and dressed. Why can't you be like him? Now you got to ask yourself a question. How do you think that makes your spouse feel? Compare and contrast. It does. I, I, I've had people, hey, the couples will come to us. Hey, can you, can you be a friend of my husband? Why? Because I want him to be like you. Woman, do you know how crazy I am? This is all a facade right here, right now. Right? You don't get it. Right? That's not, that's not the concept. Don't try to set your, your husband or your, your, your wife up on a play date to hope that well, they can, maybe they'll mentor you. No, no, that's, that's jealousy. You go into the Lord about your husband. Listen, and husbands, don't go out there dressing all crazy, disrespecting your wife. Come on now. But here's the thing, though. You take that to the Lord. Because that jealousy, that's the issue that you have. That's your insecurity. That he's making you look bad. That she's making you look bad. You take that to the Lord. You don't try to compare them or match them up with somebody else so they can influence them. No, you bring that before the Lord. And if the Lord's will is for them to get together and talk and and to be mentored, then you let the Lord work that out. You stop trying to fix it because you're going to make somebody mad and cause an argument that doesn't need to happen. Amen. Amen. Okay. Go on to verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. So they bring the twelve in there and they look them square in the face and say, What are you doing? What's wrong with you guys? Didn't we threaten you? Right? They threatened two of them. Now they arrested twelve of them. And they're like, Isn't it enough? What else do we have to do to you to get you to realize you're wrong? See, fear has kicked into overdrive. The conviction 
that they have from the true gospel and Peter even pouring it on. Hey, listen, God allowed you to kill him, but Jesus rose up as leader. Now, that was a key thing Peter said. Why do you think he said leader? Because they were all the leaders of the Jewish world. And now Peter is saying there's a new leader in town. Right? Jealousy sprouts his head. It, it's it's kind of like you're at a job and you're acting as a supervisor until the new supervisor gets hired. Then the new supervisor comes in the next day and they start doing their job. You get a little jealous. Right? People still want to come to you for problems. And you know what we start to do? We start to point out all the problems that a new supervisor is having. Well, they don't do this right. Because if I was supervisor, I, I would have done this. I would have done that. That's, that's jealousy. That's all that is. I don't care if it's whether Christian or non-Christian. We're not jealous people. Right, we don't, we don't look to get promoted. We trust the Lord to promote us in His time. We don't look necessarily for the pay raise. We trust the Lord to provide. And, he's gonna, and if He has to provide a raise, then that's what God's going to do. We trust in God. We don't, we don't brown nose it to get a job. We don't, we don't do that because we're Christians. Our contentment is in Christ. And so they were speaking truth, exposing the sin of the Sadducees by accusing them of killing Jesus and proclaiming Jesus is alive and risen. Now this is frustrating for the Sadducees because they spent all that time ensuring that Jesus was dead. That was a lot of money. They had, to, they had to arrange that thing. We don't think about the massive time and planning it took to get that to happen. They had to find somebody to betray Jesus and so they sent a covert uh, operation with Judas, paid him money to betray him, had to find him in the garden, had to make us some trumped up charge that didn't work, and then had to take him before the Roman ruler and then kind of say, listen, he's a political guy, he's going to cause an uprising. They had to do all of that. And then he was dead, and now you got 12 guys doing the exact same thing. That's frustrating. It's like when you, you, you thought you killed all the cockroaches and now you got 25 of them running around, right? It's gross. It's the only way I can bring it to you and make it real. Yeah, yeah so real. stick with you now, right? <laughs> but listen, this was frustrating. But listen, this is how we react when we, when we try to control the plans of God. We do the exact same thing. Anything that we can do to silence this and change it. When, when, when we have been constantly trying to interfere with what God is doing in the lives of those around us, or we're so jealous, we're trying to say, no, I can do it. We let people get sabotaged. We're going to get more frustrated because every time God's going to show us, you're wrong. Stop. Listen, when God gives you a warning, as just like he gave the Sadducees of releasing these apostles, that's where you need to stop. Hopefully that's a, that's, a, that's a green light that says you can go this direction and follow God, but you need to stop going the other direction. Right? And he's giving them a clear warning. But when we want people to walk in obedience towards us and rather God, this is what we do. Now the 12 here, they could have got afraid when they're about to speak up. They could have got afraid and, and told the Sadducees, we're done. No more problems for us. You arrested us. You threatened us. We're finished. But they didn't. They didn't see this persecution as a moment to, to quarrel in fear. They saw it as an opportunity to talk about God. They didn't care about the suffering. They didn't care about the pain. They didn't care what was come next because they didn't even know. But all they knew was this is an opportunity for me to share the gospel. And listen, we have to look at suffering the same way. It puts us in a place in a position to share the gospel with those who we probably never would have talked to. Put us in, 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 in an audience that we might have never seen had we not been put in this predicament. And that's why we have to look at our suffering and situations. God, this is an opportunity for me to share your truth with somebody who didn't know it. To, to tell them and confront them about their sin, but at the same time, offer them grace. Because it said Jesus offers forgiveness for all of Israel. So they're saying for you, you can be forgiven. Because sometimes we look at those who are persecuting us, those who are hating on us, putting stuff on our Facebook page that we don't like. Listen, that's an opportunity for you to tell them, listen, do you know who Jesus is? Do you know he loves you and he wants to forgive you? It's an opportunity. But we got to take it. You know, I, I, I like musicals. I don't know about you guys. I love them. You ever see the musical Annie, the new one? Mm -hmm. um, it didn't do too well in the box office, but I liked it. Right? There was this, this moment where Annie got to come up on stage and Jamie Foxx's character, William Stack, said, Come up here, Annie. I want you to talk to these people. And she sings this song called Opportunity. I really love it. I just love it. Right? And, and she's saying, This is my opportunity to share with you something new. 
Right? And, and listen, we've got to feel that saying. We've got to feel when people call us out, whether it's because they want to kill us or persecute us, whatever, and we're standing in front of them and they're waiting to hear us speak and respond. It's my opportunity to share the gospel. Because what they wanted the, the apostles to say is either we quit or we hate you guys, you guys are evil. They didn't do any of that. They saw this as a chance to speak some truth and to share forgiveness and grace. But listen, but they also, they, they shared the whole story. Jesus died, he was crucified, he rose again as Lord of Lord and Kings of Kings. And he's all for the forgiveness of Israel. Listen, because what we tend to do is we share uh, the, the gentle baby Jesus gospel. Keep, he's wrapped in the manger in those clothes. Look at that. Gentle baby Jesus. All we just share, he was crucified on the cross. And that's it. No, tell the whole story. He's risen. But he's coming back. And if he's found that you are opposing him, then you're going to have to face judgment. Like that's the part we don't want to share. We just want that, that gentle, comforting part. And, and God is calling us to share the whole thing. He's Lord of Lord. Listen, Jesus isn't coming back like some wimpy guy. He's coming back on a horse as a king, ready to make war with those. Because listen, he's coming because it's still his kingdom. I don't care who's the president. It's still his kingdom. It doesn't matter the predicament of the world at the time. It's still his kingdom. He's coming to get his people, but he's also coming to make war. Our God is a mighty God. He's a mighty warrior. And listen, so through the power of the Holy Spirit, we speak these words. It, it's not us. We don't have to sweat it out. What am I going to say when they, when they pull me out? You're, gonna, you're just going to say, Holy Spirit, speak, please. Speak through me. Give me words of wisdom to say. Glorify yourself. The words that you have, have helped me to read and understand, glorify yourself in those words. Now go on to verse 33. It says, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But the Pharisee and the council named Gamel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the man outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care for what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, Thedius rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed. And everyone who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas, the Galilean, not the same Judas that, that was a disciple, rose up in the days of the census and drew some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this is a plan undertaken is, is of men, it will fail. But it is, if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. Now, here's the thing. This was a great thing. He recognized that something else was happening. And listen, it's very obvious. Sometimes we can't tell if it's of God or not. Listen, if it's of God, it's, there's nothing you can do to stop it. You can't change it. My parents did not want me to leave St. Louis. When I mean they did everything they could to keep me in, in the STL, they did. When I mean, you know, tell me don't go in the army. God told me to tell you not to go in the army. No, that's not really what God just told me last week. But you know what? I appreciate your prayer, Mama. I love you, girl. Everything to dissuade me. And I can understand because they wanted to keep me safe. But in the end, that was God's will and they couldn't stop that. Listen, we can't stop God's will. So sometimes if you're un unclear, you pray about it, but sometimes you have to keep your mouth quiet and look and wait and be patient. Because sometimes we don't know what God's doing. We serve a big God who has a better plan than we do. And listen, especially for us parents, we think our plans for our kids are right and just. I know I do. But what if God has a different plan that I can't control? Am I going to be opposing God saying, no, no, no. God, I know, I know better. Listen, as hard as it may seem, my children are more of God's child than I, than they are my children. They're closer to God than they are closer to me. And his plan is way better than mine, more advanced than mine, has better details. My plan is kind of sloppy. You're going to live here until you're 45. Because nobody's going to hurt my baby. Right? But God's plan is, I have a plan and a purpose. But I have to act it out. So that might mean a little pain for you and a little pain for them. Will you let me do my will? Right? This is a beautiful thing. And I, I like how this guy's standing up. 
I like how he's, he's speaking out and giving truth. But notice this though in verse 40. It says, when they called the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now listen, I, I want you to see how they beat them real quick. I want to... Tamika, can I push play on this? Okay. I want you to see what it means when they beat them. Because there was this rule that you had if you were Jewish. You get 40 lashes minus one. It was a rule. It was from Deuteronomy. Right? And it was, it's because you're, you're wrong. You did something that you shouldn't have done. So you get 40 little acts. But I want you to see what it looks like. Say uh, for the kids. This is from the Passion of the Christ when Jesus got beat. So, if you don't want your kids to see it, I can understand. They can play back there. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to show you a little bit what it looks like. That's what each 12 of them got. So they just weren't taken out back and punched in the face. You get 40 whacks of that. 12 of them got that. Now here's the sad part. The high priest has stood up and said, listen, these guys, if, it, if they're so of God, let them keep doing it. Let them, let, them, let them go. If it's not, then, you know, they'll, they'll fall away. Now here's the issue with him. Even though he spoke up on their behalf, he still let that happen. Right, and, and, and this happens sometimes in the cases of abuse. We're aware of what's going on. We're aware of the bad things that are happening to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and we speak up on their behalf, but that's all we do. We still watch them get mistreated, still watch them get abused. Listen, most people get abused and someone else already knows about it, but they don't want to say anything. For whatever reason. And yet, we as Christians have to understand this. It's just as sinful if I know about it, but I don't do anything. If I, I, will, I, I told him not to do it. I, I told him it was wrong. But I watched it happen, and I did nothing. Right? That, that's where he missed it. If anything, maybe he could have said, you know what? Listen, if you're going to beat them, then you're going to have to beat me too. 
I'm not going to stand and let this happen. And this is where we have to speak up as Christians on those hard things because it's a hard thing. It's not an easy thing. And it might cost you to, to put yourself out there and get hurt yourself, but you know what? I would rather get hurt trying to do what is right than allow an injustice to happen. And all I can say is, well, I spoke up and said something about it. We have to be more bold than that. And we have to trust that no matter what happens to me, at least I tried. It's better to go down fighting than just lay down. And so he spoke to that. And these 12 apostles, listen, this is what they endured. This is what they took on. And the reason why they're getting beaten is because they were convicted by the Word of God. So instead of allowing the Word of God to penetrate their heart and cut them so deeply, according to Hebrews 4, instead of allowing them to be cut to the heart, they decided, I'm going to, the sin is exposed, so I'm going to use it to be angry, and I'm going to take this person out. Listen, silencing you does not change my sin. It doesn't change what I need to do differently. Right? It's like going to the doctor for a second opinion and you're hearing the exact same thing. So you go to another doctor to get another opinion and you still get the exact same thing. Changing doctors, changing venue will not change your medical condition. Much like my sin, if I'm convicted by what you say, me changing and not listening to you, me trying to silence you and, and maybe get you beat and in trouble is not going to change the fact that I still got sin to deal with. I've got to confront my own sin and I've got to face this thing head on and deal with it. That's what I need to do. So, but you see how far jealousy got them. They're willing to kill someone. Willing to take somebody out. All so they can feel better about themselves. And stay in some control of power. And kind of crush, crush this thing. Now listen. Peter and the apostles were not worried about this. As odd as may seem. Now as we go on it says in, in verse 40. And when they called the apostles they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing. They were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for his name. They left after being beaten that many times happy. When's the last time your mom gave you a whoop and you walked away thinking, I'm excited about that. Well, I am so happy. When's the last time your boss gave you a reprimand because you did the right thing? You were, oh man, I feel great. I got fired. Right? They left after being beaten like that. Happy. Rejoicing. Because they were counted worthy enough to suffer for the name in Christ. And it says, every day in the temple from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. In other words, they, they, they were motivated to do it even more after a beating like that. Like, and, and we didn't get all the way because I didn't want to go all the way with the cat of nine tails which is supposed to get into your skin and rip skin out. They were excited about that. They enjoyed the fact that they got to suffer for Jesus. Now listen, they weren't looking to get beat by any means. Don't go out there saying, oh, beat me for Jesus. Don't, don't do that stuff. But they were excited that the fact they got to share the gospel. And then that God counted them worthy. Listen, here's the thing about suffering. When we suffer for someone we cannot see, when we suffer for, uh, and our, all our assurance is just the faith we have in Jesus, but we're willing to suffer for it, you know what that shows? It shows those who are persecuting us that this Jesus we serve is real. If you got fired from your job because you stood up for Christ, and instead of going off yelling and screaming, you say, you know what? I count it worthy to suffer for Jesus. That shows the person who fired you that Christ must be real. Because anybody else getting fired this kind of time in America would be upset. They were willing to suffer. Peter, the apostle, later on writes in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 to 19, he says this about suffering. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes to you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. That's Peter, a guy who got beat who's saying, I'm so excited. And when you suffer, I want you to know it's a good thing. God will be glorified. So the really question is, are we ready to rejoice at the suffering? 
Are you ready to rejoice if you get persecuted? Are you willing to put yourself in that predicament? Does Christ mean so much more to you that you don't care what it takes, what you lose, but you suffer for Him? There was a, a, a Christian who was jailed in Russia who was, uh, he was uh, Chinese, I believe. And he was in his jail cell and he, he would find these little pieces of paper and he would write down a scripture and a hymn every time. And he would hang it up on his jail cell and then he would sing a hymn unto the Lord. And the guards would come in, take down the piece of paper and beat him. The next day he would find another piece of paper and he would write the same thing down, put it up in his jail cell, raise up and he would sing praise to the Lord. And everybody in the whole jail could hear this. And the guards come in the next day and they beat him. They kept doing it and doing it. And finally one day he found a huge piece of paper and he got really super excited. So he wrote down even more scriptures, even more hymns and he hung it up on his wall so he can see it and he sang the praise unto the Lord. And the guards had enough. So they came in there and they didn't beat him this time. They took him out to execute him so he could die. And they brought all the prisoners out so they can see this is what happens to these kind of people. And as he's coming out there, they're about to execute him and all the prisoners in Russia stand up and they begin to sing the praises that he sang in Russian. And the guards were scared. And they looked at that man in the face and then they just let him go. And they said, you can leave. We don't, we don't understand this. <laughs> And they let him go. And when they interviewed the guy later on for a, a, a book about Christians being persecuted, and they asked him, what was it like? He said, I didn't know, uh, know a single bit of Russian, but it sounded like a chorus of angels. And he just, and he sang the song again. Right? Because in his mind, all that mattered was Christ. Just like the apostles' mind. They got beat, they can rejoice because all that matters is Christ. Jesus told them, you're blessed if you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. You're blessed if you get insulted and evil works done against, against you and falsely accused. For my sake, you're blessed and your reward is in heaven. The problem with our suffering is that we don't really think our reward is in heaven. We want to see the reward right now. We don't want to die. We don't want to die for Christ sometimes the way you know, we, we hear about it. I don't want to get shot. I'm not looking forward to that. But listen... That's how much Christ has to mean to you. That if it costs you your life, you say, you know what? My life means nothing when compared to knowing Christ. If they take your house, you get to see how God provides shelter for you. If they throw you in jail, you get a chance to share the gospel with people you may not have shared it with. If they kill you, you get to live with Jesus forever. And so as Christians, we're willing to suffer. But also, we're not jealous people. We're not going to hold somebody back because we want to be seen and heard. When we see abuse, we're going to speak up and say something about it. We're not going to sit there and watch it as if nothing's wrong. Because we're God's people. So now we're going to do head, heart, and hands. And so the, the, the head part is, how did God speak to you? What is He saying to you? I want you to truly think about that. I also want you to think about uh, how do you feel about it. If you feel convicted or encouraged, that's great. But the last part is, hands, what are you going to do about it to make it come to pass? So I just pray you take that time to think about it right now.